Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just as a reminder, all GSA online events are covered by a code of conduct. We will be posting that in the chat shortly for you to review. And with that, I'm going to turn us over to Dr. Hugo Bellin for introductions to today's speaker. All right. You remove your screen. Stop share. That's great. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to introduce Melissa Handel uh, today. Uh, she started with a degree in chemistry from Reed College, and then she moved to the University of Wisconsin in Madison for her graduate studies, where she studied the gene exotrophin. So she wasn't really into bioinformatics up to that point very much. She then in, uh, moved to the University of Oregon as a postdoctoral research to study thyroid hormones in the zebrafish with Monty Westerfield, upon which she decided to stay in Oregon and moved to the Oregon Health Science Center, where she became a faculty and eventually a professor in medical informatics at the Oregon Health Science Center in Portland, where she served as the director of the Center for Data of Health. Uh, and her research makes use of data to improve the discovery and diagnosis of diseases. And this is where the Monarch Initiative that she'll be talking about today uh, is focused on. This year, earlier in March, Melissa was named Chief Research Informatics Officer at the University of Colorado at Anschutz Medical Campus, where she currently has a senior position and is similarly responsible for, you know, data information systems to accelerate biomedical discoveries. Melissa, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we'll, you'll let me know, Hugo, if everything looks good. Looks great. Perfect. All right. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about the Monarch Initiative and the Monarch Initiatives really um, founded back in about um, the beginnings back in about 2008, when um, a few of us got together and started thinking about how could we make phenotypic data as computable as genotypic data. Um, and so fast forward to today, and I'm going to give you a kind of a smattering overview of all the different initiatives that the Monarch Initiative uh, is involved in, um, with the idea that it hopes improve the way in which we think about the research that we do, whether it be on any given model organism, in cell lines, or in a clinical research context. Also, these slides are going to be publicly available, posted at that bit.ly, um, and so we welcome uh, feedback uh, via Twitter as well. So first, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the vision of precision medicine and the, and the kind of way in which we think about phenotypic data um, in a translational context. So over there on the left, um, we currently, in the electronic health record or clinical encounter context, capture um, very specific discrete clinical data elements, such as family history, clinical notes, clinical labs, diagnostic imaging, drugs, survey instruments, and even increasingly genetics. But we live in a world where we have increasing high throughput data. We can do pedigree analyses. We can capture information um, about exercise or wearables. We can do biomonitoring. We, we have microbiome assessments, dietary assessments, and all of the omics um, uh, that are uh, possible to help describe the characteristics of a patient. Furthermore, the patient um, does not exist in a world that is discrete in terms of those clinical encounters, but in their, in their real life, they are a complete picture over time of all of these different things. And so when we think about phenotypic data capture, we have to kind of keep these things in mind. How do we sort of think about multimodal data um, in terms of characterizing the phenotypic features of the patient, and how do we use this uh, for modern classification strategies that get us a little closer to precision medicine. So when my child was four years old, he said to me, mama, people are a lot like dogs. And I said, why, yes, Sam, they are, <laughs> as a sort of evolutionary biologist background. Um, and, and so, you know, I think 
it's it's really really important that we don't forget um, how to think about um, how we can learn from other organisms to inform our understandings of disease and disease mechanisms in humans and in, in, in other species. And so that's really what the Monarch Initiative is all about. So there are many um, different key organisms that can help inform uh, our understanding of disease. Uh, so for example, and I just, I really like to show this slide because we think about traditional model organisms which have many wonderful advantages, but there are so many um, specific phenotypic features that are specific to certain species or certain taxa. It's important not to forget that we learn different things from different organisms. So for example, the dog's retina has area centralis, which is analogous to the human macula, which is very useful to study naturally occurring cone diseases. Aged cats are natural models of Alzheimer's disease. Naked mole rats don't get cancer. Um, armadillos are the natural host for the organism uh, that causes leprosy, and it's the only other organism besides humans. Um, tree shrews, glioblastomas, are morphologically and genetically similar to humans and more similar than mouse models. Um, great pond snails are models of inflammation-mediated memory dysfunction, and silkworms are a model for uric acid metabolism. The list that like these organisms goes on and on and on and on. So we in the Monarch Initiative aim to try to help inventory what we understand about the phenotypic variability and models of disease from all the different organisms. Oops. So semantics are the universal converter um, underlying our ability to focus on the inventorying of phenotypic characteristics across species um, are semantics. And when it when it really when you really think about it, each different community, each different organism community, each different domain community, they use different languages. We need a way to make these uh, um, phenotypic characteristics, characteristics uh, within each uh, community um, interoperable with the others so that we can complete our inventorying and computability. So we call this crossing the chasm of semantic despair. And in particular, this is challenging, um, harking back to my first slide about classifying clinical data. So over on the right, I spoke a lot about all those different kinds of clinical data, but for the most part in our different model organism and non-model organism communities, we don't really think about um, you know, the same kind of data or, this, or have the same kinds of tools or standards in those contexts. We have all the omics data, we have molecular simulations and cellular models. Um, and fundamentally the data, the ontologies and terminologies, the tools, the standards, they're all different in the basic research um, and evolutionary biology research communities than they are in the clinical research. And so what we aim to do is create a bridge across these different uh, communities or crossing the chasm of semantic spare, despair uh, coined by Dr. Chris Schutt. Um, by you know, really helping support unification of human data, development of ontologies, tools, web services, visualization, widgets for use in third-party websites, standards for phenotypic data exchange, such as phenopackets, which I'll talk a little bit, and deploying these resources in the context of a clinical setting. So as we all learn um, in our grade school biology, the central dogma is that your genetic endowment plus your environment um, results in the traits that uh, uh, are the characteristics of you. But we know it's a lot more complicated than just that. There are many, many different relationships and iterations that happen over time between genes, the environment, and our, and our traits. Um, so the standards for encoding and exchanging information must be up to encoding all of the different squiggly lines. So it's not, so if we want to kind of think about what some of those bits actually are, just thinking about the relationship between a gene and a disease. Is it a causal relationship? Does it contribute to it? Is it a risk factor? Does it protect against that disease? Does it correlate with it? Does it modulate it? Does it increase the susceptibility? And the list goes on and on for all of the different types of relationships. And we need to make these relationships um, computable within and across species in order to help reveal molecular mechanisms of disease and help support diagnostic use cases. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ontologies because they are really foundational to the infrastructure within the Monarch Initiative. So an ontology is really kind of a formal classification structure. Um, it essentially is a set of terms, knowledge artifacts, if you will, that are related to one another in both a, um, in a logically related way, 
they're human and machine readable in terms. So if I wanna describe um, hypertelarism as a differential spacing of the eyes, I would have that human readable definition, but I would also have a logical one that the computer could read that could be used uh, to support inference and data queries. The other thing about ontologies is that they are generally community developed and have generalizable knowledge. Um, we work really hard with the community and we would welcome everyone to participate um, in the capture of your knowledge about you know, phenotypic features, disease features, and other ontologies that help support our understanding of biology based upon the community's knowledge. Fundamentally, these ontologies help us organize data, filter data, connect data, and suggest data, um, and are the foundation of all the computational research that we do within the Monarch Initiative. Foundational to the Monarch Initiative is the Human Phenotype Ontology, or HPO. Um, the HPO was first instantiated by Peter Robinson, um, and the axioms or logical um, structures within the human phenotype ontology make it especially unique in the clinical context because those um, relationships can be captured and, and create those associations with basic research data. So unlike most of the other clinical terminologies that are used in a clinical context, this one is fundamentally translational in its ability to integrate data and, and in its computability. Um, there's approximately uh, 14,500 different terms represented by the balls in this graph. Um, and an example of that interoperability can be seen on the left where we have, for example, hyposmia is actually um, represented as a change in the gene ontology term, sensory perception of smell. Uh, in the last time I did this calculation, that particular term was associated with 34,000 annotations in two, 22 different species. So all of a sudden, just by indicating that we have that phenotypic feature of hyposmia, that lack of a sensory perception of smell, we can associate that feature with quite a lot of data coming from many other organisms. And the human phenotype ontology um, has been uh, widely adopted in the rare disease community and the genetics community for uh, diagnostic tools in particular, but also to support computability for mechanism discovery. Here's an example of how the human phenotype ontology can be utilized. So um, these are, this is actually a real case. Um, on the left, we had a three-year-old girl come into the clinic approximately two weeks um, uh, at a different time from the 14-year-old boy who's shown on the right. The phenotypic features are captured using human phenotype ontology terms. Um, and so you can see things like cone-shaped epiphysis of the phalanges of the hand matches the Monarch Initiative's gold standard for Weidemann Steiner syndrome in the, there in the middle, but it's not an exact match. There we see short middle phalanx of the finger, but using the phenotype comparison algorithm, we can actually do what we call that fuzzy matching. And we don't do just that fuzzy matching on an individual phenotypic feature by feature, but rather on the whole profile itself. And so if we go back to the prior slide, you can think of the patient as a set of nodes in this graph. And it's those set of nodes that we're actually trying to best fit against what we know from a standard gold standard uh, representation of our known diseases here, Weidemann Steiner syndrome. And in this case, both of these patients, despite some of them having kind of opposite phenotypic features such as long toe versus short toe or non-exact matches to the gold standard for Weidemann Steiner syndrome, both matched Weidemann Steiner syndrome and both had a variant in the KMT to a gene. This also gets at the question of how do we define a disease? Are there two types of Weidemann Steiner disease? Um, should we lump or split um, uh, this disease into two, even though there are different variants in the same gene? Um, and that is actually the subject of much discussion uh, in our collaboration with ClinGen on the lumping and splitting group and the disease nomenclature group. So this kind of shows you a little bit about how that breaks down. Um, and so here, for example, we might have abnormal uh, re, uh, abnormality of the orbital region, which might be which is associated with 2,644 different diseases in our gold standard corpus of diseases. And as you get more granular in terms of the phenotypic features, such as abnormality of the ocular adnexa or abnormality of the eyelid or telecanthus, you get increasingly fewer diseases that have that phenotypic feature, 164 for telecanthus. These are annotated using the Mondo ontology, which I'll talk about here shortly. So Mondo um, came about, Mondo means for the world. 
um, came about because we found it very challenging to reconcile the representation of diseases coming from the many different resources shown on the left, such as OMIM, Orphanet, the National Cancer Institute's thesaurus, the GARD, EFO, the Disease Ontology, MESH, Medic, and actually the num there are many others. Um, and in this context, the way in which these different disease entities were represented um, were very different in all of the different sources. Um, and so my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Mungle, created an algorithm called KBOOM, or Bayesian Owl Ontology Merging, which contains a logical and probabilistic inference that generates um, potential candidates for equivalency across these different resources so that we could finally try to reconcile the different disease um, uh, entities from the different resources. It's important to remember that these different um, resources were created for different, um, uh, for different goals. Um, but fundamentally all have rare disease information in them. And in order to create those gold standard in a robust manner that would work in all contexts around the world, we really needed a way to create um, a consensus standard that would, un would unite them all. And so we have been working with all of these different groups to create Mondo equivalencies and reclassification of diseases based upon um, the iteration between the KBOOM algorithm and uh, curation assisted equivalence um, uh, validation and then feeding those back to the in initial sources. Um, when we actually looked um, at the different resources, um, and this is actually published uh, with the link at the bottom, we found that um, what was really uh, surprising and interesting was not only was the number of rare diseases not seven, approximately 7,000 as originally depicted in the Orphan Drug Act and the number that is most often quoted, but rather over 10,000. And in fact, it's probably more like about 12,000 to date. Um, and the other interesting thing that we noticed is here, we're looking at five selected sources, the NCIT, the Disease Ontology, GARD, Orphanet, and OMIM. We found that many diseases are only in one source. Um, and in fact, only 333 diseases that we looked at in these five sources were found in all five of these commonly used sources. Um, and so it really speaks to the need to reconcile disease information and then being able to use that as a handle for the phenotypic features that describe those diseases and then be able to use those phenotypic features to compare against model organisms. So let's move on to model organisms. Why do model or organisms matter to patients? More species means more coverage of the human genome. Over there on the left, uh, we have um, 19,201 uh, genes in the human genome, uh, coding genes. Um, of those, 4,092 of them have causal mutations associated with them that we know the phenotypic outcomes for those. When we look over on the right, if we take the orthologs of those 19,201 um, genes and we look at which ones have phenotypic characteristics um, based upon those in the top five most commonly utilized model organisms, um, C. elegans, the fruit fly, the zebrafish, the mouse, um, and yeast, we actually see that we have um, uh, 12,000 of those genes have phenotypic features with the overlap of um, 3,986. So this really, um, if by inference, um, an inclusion of these phenotypic information for um, genes for which we don't really uh, have any information about causal variations in the human, we can potentially infer um, up to 85% coverage of the human coding genome using information about the phenotypic features of the ortholog in these five other species. This is a huge amount of potentially relevant phenotypic information coming from other species. The question is, how do we actually help machines understand what those phenotypic features actually are in all the different species? And that is really the fundamental challenge that the Monarch Initiative aims to overcome. So for example, if a clinician says palmer, palmoplantar hyperkeratosis, the computer will say, I have absolutely no idea what that means. How do I relate that to other species? How do I relate that to anything? So different communities use different languages. Um, so the uh, patient might refer to palmoplantar hyperkeratosis as thick hand skin, whereas we might have a related phenotype in the mouse for ulcerated paws. 
it's not a matter of string matching across species. These are potentially similar, but maybe not identical um, concepts uh, in the different species. And the other problem is that each community or data source has a proliferation of different vocabularies or ontologies. So for, for on the right, we might describe those phenotypic, uh, um, feed the palmal plantar hyperkeratosis using the human phenotype ontology. Um, and we might compare the ulcerated paws using the mammalian phenotype ontology that's utilized by, uh, utilized and developed by the uh, mouse genome uh, informatics uh, organization. But it actually gets much crazier than that. We have many different clinical terminologies. They're not very interoperable. Many people make mappings across them. And then we have a plethora of different terminologies that are utilized in the different um, organism, veterinary, evolutionary biology communities um, over on the left. And this is only um, just a few of the very, very many um, that exist. And so we have um, spent quite uh, an effort to reconcile how all these different terminologies are represented and making them computable and working, uh, getting them to work together. So here is one of the strategies that we use to do that. So here, for example, we can take the term from the human phenotype ontology for palmal plantar hyperkeratosis, and we can break that down into sort of logical parts, if you will, using species neutral ontologies and homologous concepts. So here, for example, we would say that palmal plantar hyperkeratosis is um, uh, increased from the pedo ontology, which is a, a ontology of qualities. The gene ontology characterization is a process. Um, we use the Uberon anatomy ontology, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, to talk about the stratum corneum layer of the skin, which is part of the autopod, um, which is found in, in um, uh, uh, organisms with legs and arms, if you will. Um, and so how do we, uh, so this is, this is a way that we can sort of create this pattern and then when we look at ulcerated paws and we say, hey, the pattern for how this, this logical representation um, is, is encoded for ulcerated paws looks exactly the same or has a fuzzy match, uh, similar to what I showed you before for the um, Weidemann Steiner syndrome patients, we can actually align these representations across species and make them computable across species. So um, as I mentioned, Uberon is an anatomy ontology that um, really supports that representation of anatomy in many different organisms. It's metazoan uh, focused. Um, and in this case, um, we have associations with other um, different uh, ontologies, such as the gene ontology, the cell ontology, and CBI taxon. Um, it has a full representation of development and developmental staging across species to try to align stages as well. And so here on the right, for example, you can see a representation of the alveolus of the lung, um, which is uh, found in mammals. Um, we have cell types that um, are alveolar macrophage, for example, there's a relationship there. Um, alveolus of lung um, is also found in species specific equivalent ontologies, such as for the human or the mouse shown on the right. Um, and you can see that we also have um, homology representations, and we've been working with BG to help support um, the homology recommendations for understanding things like the relationship between the alveolus and the swim bladder um, uh, found in uh, fishes. So the representation is really a knowledge graph of um, an anatomical structures, cellular structures found uh, throughout development across a range of species and representing those association with the different taxonomic levels. Um, it's computable and, and utilized as a foundation for how we represent phenotypic features uh, within the human phenotype ontology and other ontologies. Um, and so this is how we do the same sort of thing, but for phenotypic features. So we have a project called the Euphino Ontology, and this is really where I would welcome the community to participate in how we represent phenotypic features um, in those templated type structures, like I showed you for, for palmal plantar hyperkeratosis. We can create templates within each species specific ontology. So for here, for example, we have on the left, we have the zebrafish ontology, phenotypic ontology in the light blue and the human phenotype ontology in the pink. The stars represent terms that all follow those same kind of templated patterns. And when, what we do then is we can kind of bring them all together into what we call Euphino, 
where we can harmonize across the different species representations for those terms that are templated. So here, for example, we might have phenotypic similarity between the enlarged heart and zebrafish and human, um, but those can actually be inferred based upon looking at genes impact, impacting heart cell size um, in this heart of the zebrafish based on orthology. Um, and so it's a way of sort of bridging phenotypic similarity across species using a standardized uh, logical approach. So here's how that actually works. Um, so for example, we might have um, a human disease uh, on the right where we might have a term for renal hypoplasia. That term renal hypoplasia might match a duplex kidney found in a mouse where the term in common based upon those templates is abnormal kidney morphology. Um, and similarly, we might have relationships for the high palate versus cleft palate. Um, we have abnormal palate morphology. Um, et cetera. And so you can see the same kind of fuzzy matching across the graph as we did for the Weidemann Steiner syndrome, but here we're doing it across species based upon those um, templates and interoperability using the Eupheno ontology. And the link here is, uh, uh, is over on the left. If you're interested in having your organism participate or your community or domain participate, we really welcome uh, all participants. Um, so putting it all together. So really what we're trying to do here is to put together how we relate form, function, and dysfunction in order to interpret the genome. Over on the right, I talked about um, the Uberon anatomy ontology and how we can relate, for example, the stylopod in different species. And you can see a representation of the stylopod there. Uh, and then um, that, that Uberon anatomy then um, forms the foundation of how we represent um, uh, gene function using the gene ontology. So how, how we might represent respiratory gaseous exchange um, using the gene ontology is um, based upon representation of a gas exchange organ in the Uberon anatomy ontology, um, uh, as well as abnormal blood gas levels in the Eupheno ontology. So if Eupheno is sort of the gene dysfunction, the consequences of gene dysfunction, whereas the gene ontology is the gene function with Uberon providing the logical underpinnings of its representation. So here, for example, um, you can see lungs and gills have convergent evolutionary function. We have form, the swim bladders and the lungs are functionally divergent, but have um, commonalities at the molecular level. Um, and at cellular level, we can look at fish-specific multi-scale relationships, the gill to lamella, versus the mammal-specific multi-scale relationships, lung to alveolus. And the cell ontology would include these, uh, this information um, within that. And so together, all of these representations form uh, a knowledge graph that represents um, uh, gene function uh, and gene dysfunction at all scales. So what do we do with all of this? Well, we can combine all of this information um, with our genomic information and genomic algorithms. Um, and this helps us prioritize variants to help support uh, genomic diagnostics. So here uh, on the left, we have, um, uh, or actually in the middle, we have a patient. The patient has a whole genome sequence or a whole exome sequence in a BCF file. And we perform deep phenotyping on this patient in the sense that we have a phenotypic profile encoded using human phenotype ontologies. So we have the patient's variants and we have the patient's phenotypes. So the variants go through and are compared against genomic reference information. There's a variety of different algorithms that can be used to remove off-target variants, to remove common variants, to remove benign variants, to remove variants that are inconsistent with the mode of inheritance. And at the other end, we have a much smaller list, but still too many uh, variants um, that come about. And hopefully we've been able to obtain um, exomes or genomes from family members so we can help support um, the use of the pedigree information to also um, help prioritize these variants. On the phenotypic side, and this is really where the Monarch Initiative has contributed extensively to the improvements in uh, variant prioritization for genomic diagnostics, we take those patient phenotypes and we compare them against those um, gold standard disease references, as well as a variety of other reference resources, such as for protein-protein interactions and looking at all the um, orthologs in the different species. And we take that information and we prioritize the variants by calculating similarity between the patient's 
phenoprofile and the phenotypic profile of each known disease by calculating the similarity between the patient and the phenotypic profile of each known mouse and fish gene or, or genotype. And then we also look at the protein-protein interactions to look by sort of a guilt by association uh, in case one of those candidates might be a higher priority. And that information then is combined together um, with the variant filterization to come up with a, a final prioritized list of variants that may be causal for a patient's um, um, uh, disease. So that's been really successful. Also um, successful has been um, the teasing apart of multiple molecular lesions. Um, and this was a really impactful patient paper that came out in 2017 that was able to show the phenotypic features um, were able to actually help delineate multiple molecular lesions happening um, within an individual patient or family. Um, and in this case, 4.9% of the exomes had with dual molecular diagnoses were, be, were able to be differentiated with this type of deep phenotyping approach. And so finally, I just wanted to give an example. This is a, an earlier example of a patient from Genomics England, um, just to kind of show you how this, this works um, in a real case where we had over 6 million variants um, in Jessica's genome. She has a rare condition which causes epilepsy and affects her movement and developmental delay, um, and her standard genetics tests were negative. 677,000 of those variants were rare, 2,826 were predicted to cause a change to a protein, and 67 were different to her parents. So what, what we were able to do is to show using our Examizer tool that combines the genomic uh, information with the phenotypic information um, actually ranked uh, this gene first. Um, and this gene um, turned out to be um, the smoking gun, uh, uh, de novo deletion in SLC2A1. Um, and it turns out that um, she is actually successfully treated with a ketogenic low carb diet. So we've had some really terrific successes um, uh, in the context of our application uh, uh, of the Examizer tool in Genomics England led by Damian Smedley. Um, and he's been able to show that Examizer ranks, uh, ranking is 94% of the top three candidates using both human and model organism data. So in case you're thinking that your model organism data that's sharing it isn't impactful, it's really impactful that we have maximized the sharing and the computability of these genotype phenotype data in the context of the model organism databases as well as in, within the literature. So um, we welcome questions about how to do that better and about how to do that at scale if anyone has a need for sharing data. So I want to talk a little bit about the work with IMPC. Um, here, for example, we've been able to work closely with IMPC um, to um, look for candidates based upon information uh, coming from the mouse. So here, for example, uh, CDKN2A is a candidate for a cataracts genomics England patient. Um, and so this is just a way that we can align uh, and aid diagnosis using this model matching um, when no human uh, data actually exists for this gene. Similarly, um, we can actually kind of take a look across all the different characteristics. And this was um, work that was done for a prior workshop with COMP uh, IMPC to kind of look at how should we prioritize what, um, you, you know, what, what knockouts should be made um, for COMP. And so basically looking at um, all the different genes, we can categorize them based upon those that have mouse phenotypes, those that have ortho, that are ortholog phenotypes, those that have human orthologs with disease associations, those that have human orthologs with phenotype associations, um, et cetera. And so by doing this, we can, we can show, for example, that um, 4,450 of the potential comp knockout genes have phenotypes of interacting proteins in other species. Um, 4,365 had phenotypes in mice, um, 3,748 had no phenotypes in human, um, and 1,600 have phenotypes in other species. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it really sort of helped us um, sort of contribute to the COMP program to decide which were the most valuable knockouts to make. Um, and I think, you know, it really kind of comes back to that fact that when we look at the causal mutations or even just other kinds of associations, 
uh, between genes and phenotypes in humans. There's just a lot of genes for which we have very little information. And so this type of phenotypic comparison approach and sort of guilt by association approach can actually help inform what would be the most useful um, knockouts to make. Of course, there are many other considerations such as embryonic lethals and things like that that also have to be taken into account. So this is an example um, uh, looking using that phenotypic comparison model for looking for new disease models for known diseases. So here, for example, we, we identified uh, a new model for diamond black fan, fan anemia based upon phenotypic profile similarity of increased mean corpuscular hemoglobin and decreased erythrocyte cell numbers. Um, and it turns out that this may account for as much as 46% of people with diamond black fan anemia with unknown genetic causes. Um, and so this is published and um, we were able to identify 135 new candidate genes for Mendelian disorders for which we did not have a causal mutation. So putting this all together, and I just, for those who are maybe more computational in our audience, I thought it might be useful to kind of see um, how it's all put together to our overarching monarch knowledge graph. Um, and so in that knowledge graph, we have um, many different data sources shown there um, in the middle column that we use different ontologies to help bring together into the different domains. So we use Mondo, for example, to capture all the different annotations that come in from the different sources using all the different terminologies. Ufino for all the phenotypic features, which we've spoken up about. Uberon for anatomy and gene expression. Um, uh, the genotype ontology, which I haven't talked about, which really kind of supports how, how genes and gene attributes are represented. Um, and of course, the gene ontology for subcellular anatomy and gene functions. And these all come together into our monarch, monarch knowledge graph. Um, and I think probably the key um, numbers are we have approximately 818,000 gene to phenotype associations from 50 species, um, including mouse, worm, yeast, American mink, Japanese rice fish, and various species of livestock, and of course, many species in the Drosophila uh, taxa. Um, we also have 9,000 gene to disease causal associations from human and mouse and 30,000 non-causal gene to disease associations from more than 70 species. And we continue to try to ingest new data sources and new species and are always welcoming um, suggestions. You can actually access the Monarch data through our API at the link shown below. And lots of crunching on these types of numbers is found at, at the other link at, at the bottom. Okay, I wanted to also mention a collaboration that we've had ongoing for a number of years, but more recently um, has uh, um, really um, focused on some new work uh, on building a breed ontology, really trying hard to get the veterinary community uh, and veterinary data um, integrated into the Monarch Knowledge Graph. So the OMIA um, is sort of an analogous platform to OMIM, but focused on veterinary species and veterinary diseases. And we've been mapping the livestock traits and phenotypes to Ufino and integrating the animal diseases into Mondo. So Mondo will be a cross-species disease ontology. Um, alongside of that, we're building a new breed ontology that brings in different resources um, such as LBO, VNOM, DATIS, and, and the OMIA original um, inventory. And it turns out that it's a similar kind of problem uh, to inventorying diseases for Mondo is that how breeds are defined um, differs in these different nomenclature systems. So really trying to reconcile how we represent breeds so that we can create genotype phenotype associations for each of them. So next I'm gonna show a little bit about um, uh, some of the kind of core features in our website, uh, monarchinitiative.org. Um, and again, foundational to our site is really the ability to query across and within species based upon phenotypic features. Um, so if you, uh, shown here is sort of a, just an example disease page for endometriosis, um, which has been a favorite lately as it's the subject of our graduate students, uh, Lauren Chan's work. Um, and in this context, you can see the tabs on the left to look at phenotypic features shown at the bottom on the bottom uh, lower right, as well as genotypes that might um, be models of that disease uh, shown on the bottom left. This is a tool called the phenotypic profile search. Um, and if you go here, you can create a profile of your own. Um, you can do so by typing them in and auto-completing, or you can generate a list from a known gene or a known disease. 
Um, so here, for example, at the bottom, I've typed in Fanconi anemia, it's auto-completing, and that's going to auto-populate -pop all the phenotypic features from our gold standard uh, for Fanconi anemia, um, such as um, abnormality of the upper limb, um, short stature, um, strabismus, uh, et cetera, and there are actually quite a lot of phenotypic features curated for Fanconi anemia. Those all then become the subject um, of the search to look for comparable phenotypic features uh, within and across species. And so here's what that looks like. In this case, I've said, I wanna compare against all matching genes in all species. Um, actually, no, I've chosen mouse here at the bottom. Um, and you can see you can, you can um, decide which species you want to compare against. And out the other end, you see this, what we call phenogrid. Um, and so the phenotypic features that I started with are shown here on the, on, the, um, on the left. And then I'm comparing those phenotypic features with the phenotypic features um, from each of these mouse genes. Um, and so they've been summarized at the gene level. Obviously, there are multiple genotypes represented for each gene. And the darker the, the, the blue square, the more similar um, the phenotypic feature. And so, and they're ordered in terms of um, the most specific. Um, so this um, gene here, CTNNB1, is the most similar to the set of terms that I have uh, provided for the search. Um, and this is only a partial um, uh, show, display. So you can navigate to increasingly less similar um, genes or um, less matching phenotypic features at the bottom. And so this provides a nice, um, a nice sort of visual overview of what is the phenotypic similarity of the profile uh, across species. I'm going to talk briefly now about exchanging phenotypic information. Um, this is work that's done in collaboration with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And if you think about the fact we have many different um, standards for, ex for exchanging information about uh, gene sequence, we really to this to date have not had a standard for exchanging information about phenotypic features. And so the goal of the phenopackets effort is really to try to do that. So phenopackets can help us um, describe what phenotypic features were observed or not observed how they're linked to the patient, to the genomic information, to samples, to parents and siblings. They can document when they were first observed and when they um, were no longer observed. We can document how severe they are and whether or not some were more severe than others. Um, and so uh, we have uh, many different use cases for phenopackets. Uh, providers such as physicians, patients, and families, researchers, authors, laboratories, genetic counselors have many different data sources that, that um, basically need to be exchanged in terms of the phenotypic features. If we think about in particular the use case of a clinical laboratory um, sending off or a clinic, a clinical um, a genetics clinic sending off a request to a clinical laboratory, they, um, they often send an, a PDF of the EHR or a candidate diagnosis, neither of which are particularly useful. In this case, FIRE, uh, or the phenopacket um, aims to support a robust computational representation of the phenotypic features encoded with human phenotype ontology terms or other ontology terms to help support um, diagnostics in a clinical lab context, but also patient matchmaking, um, as well as cohort identification. And so we really hope that um, we can develop phenopackets for different organisms, um, but especially to support the use of clinical phenotypic information in the sort of translational and bioinformatics communities. Uh, um, so we can find more information about, about this at phenopackets.org. And then finally, as it relates to matching patients um, to uh, model organisms, the Matchmaker Exchange has been a very successful GA4GH initiative that fundamentally um, aims to match um, patients to find other patients at other clinical sites. And so you can say, you know, a clinician with patient A says, who is like my patient? Um, and there's a, a human phenotype uh, profile uh, query, uh, as well as a genetic or gene query that goes out to the other clinical sites. Well, the Monarch Initiative not only has supported the phenotypic algorithm for matching phenotypic information against other patients, but also using that same uh, approach that I, I showed earlier with Eupheno, we can match against model organisms as well and return information about which model organisms match that patient best 
This can not only provide uh, candidates for a diagnosis, but also potential collaborators uh, to support disease research uh, relating to that given patient or family. So the takeaways are essentially that semantics can help us cross the chasm of semantic despair and support more meaningful patient cl classification. So basically using organismal data to help support this more meaningful patient classification, whether it's for diagnostics or for mechanism discovery or for treatment selection. Um, realizing standardized and computable phenotypic data is akin to genomic data has revolutionized diagnostics and discovery. We are so excited um, to help bring phenomics into the world of genomics. Um, and I think the, the two go hand in hand. Uh, we talk a lot about the um, genomic revolution and you know, how inexpensive it is to run a whole genome, but it's really fundamentally the interpretation of that genome that is our stumbling block uh, at present. And the phenotypic information present in a computable form for both patients and model organisms is fundamental to that interpretation. The dynamic interplay between public data and clinical and patient level data is also key. Um, we need to be able to share patient level data more effectively, but we also need to be able to contextualize that patient data um, in the context of more and more public data, whether that's um, biologically relevant stratification or clinically relevant stratification. Um, and then finally, uh, combining clinical and basic research data supports new hypotheses, mechanism discovery, and better treatment management uh, for patients. So I just wanted to put a plug in for um, helping make Monarch better. Uh, we're currently undergoing a big user interface push, and we would love um, if any of you are interested in that in particular, but also in any of our ontology standards or development efforts. Um, it's an open science team effort internationally across all organisms, and we welcome uh, all, all comers. So please contact us at info at tislab.org. Um, and if you're interested in doing a UI interview, uh, we have some uh, fun t-shirts, gift cards, and, and other, other um, bennies. Finally, I would like to thank um, the very, very many people that make Monarch possible. Um, my, my longstanding colleagues for many years in, in designing and, and implementing the Monarch Initiative, uh, Peter Robinson, Chris Mungle, Damian Smedley, and David Osumi Sutherland, as well a whole, as a whole host of key characters shown on the left that have contributed extensively over many years. Um, I also would like to thank the very, very many resources that have contributed data to the Monarch Initiative for which uh, Monarch Initiative would not exist. And then finally, um, I'd like to, to thank our two major funding sources over the past many years, um, the NIH Office of Director um, R24 Award from ORIP and the NHGRI for our Center uh, of Excellence in Genome Sciences. So thanks very much to everyone. And I have time for some questions. Thank you, Melissa. Great seminar. So if people have questions, they can put them on chat. I'm just going to check if there is anything there. I don't see any questions except great. Thank you, Melissa, for the presentation. So one of the key issues, obviously, is to match phenotypes with genes among organisms. If you go from worms to flies to fish to, you know, higher up, could you use a more gene-centric approach and think about phenologs and use that? I, I, you didn't mention that in your work. Yeah, actually, I, I probably could have included a slide. So I, I think about, um, absolutely, the answer is absolutely. We, we think about the relationship between disease models um, in, in an organismal context in multiple ways. So you can say, for example, a curator can say, this model is a model of this human disease. And we have a lot of assertions that come from the different model organism databases that, that look like that. We can take an approach where we say, um, there's an ortholog that is, um, that is a variant that is causal in human and therefore, a variant, that similar variant in an ortholog would be a model of disease. Those are the most straightforward ones that have existed for a long time. 
Monarch has really brought the ability to compare phenotypic features, whether they be at the subcellular level, which often makes sense in the context of our more distant um, relatives, if you will. Um, uh, and then there's the phenologs approach that was pioneered by, by uh, Ed Marcotte. Um, and we have also implemented that technology, which is really a sort of enrichment strategy for looking for candidate genes um, that might be uh, um, good models for disease uh, in other more distant organisms. And so he had a really lovely paper uh, some time back about looking at um, breast cancer models um, in organisms without breasts. Um, and so, so I think it's really important to take all four of those approaches together. Um, and that's one of the things that we aim to do with, um, with the Monarch Initiative is to kind of bring those four approaches together. All right. So there's uh, a few questions here. Jane Hubbard asks- uh, so, so can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. So yeah, I just I would just follow up on Hugo's question. I had exactly the same question. Um, I wondered if you could, um, that paper you just mentioned, could you, uh, would that be made, could that be made available? I'm curious about that breast cancer. Sure, sure, and, yeah. And, and, and then the other one, just to stretch that a little bit, I mean, they're a database of known um, phenologs. There are so many in the literature that are completely lost, I feel, to the database world. Um, uh, you know, worm vulva development and Alzheimer's disease, for example, were connected through the presenilins, you know, and this is something that was completely, you know, you can't, you can't possibly get there uh, except through the gene centric approach. So I, I'm wondering what is the strategy? What would be the strategy to better um, fill in that arm of your work that I think would, would, would expand even more the connections between the various um, genes in the less uh, closely related um, organisms? Absolutely, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I think the answer is, is it definitely has to be a multifold approach. Um, one thing is, is we, we have done some work to mine the literature um, and the more we can improve the representation of different species within Eupheno and the species specific anatomy and phenotype ontologies, the more that text mining um, can be utilized. And that text mining can look for um, essentially phenotypic profiles in a given paper. Um, and we can have sort of, you know, metrics and algorithms that help assess the sort of quality of those, those matches. And we've been able to do that really quite successfully for human phenotypic uh, profiles. And we'd really like to do more um, with the different organismal um, uh, uh, efforts. And I, I think it's especially important for organisms that don't have a model organism database. So that's really where we see the huge loss because that information isn't really curated anywhere. And without standards like phenopackets or standard ways of sharing genotype phenotype data in the context of those types of manuscripts in a computable way, we're kind of left to sort of profile matching and text, text mining uh, of those articles. Um, we do try to curate some key um, resources in directly into the Monarch Initiative, but we really need a broader community uh, to help do that. The second thing is, is that we can actually target them um, by doing the kind of gene-centric approach and phenolog approach that you suggested. So for example, if I know that I've got a candidate gene um, that might be a good model for a disease, but nobody's really curated that information, um, I can query the literature and find that information and go and curate it and try to include it into the knowledge graph. If there are key areas that the community feels are really missing, um, we are, we're really happy to try to prioritize that and have been um, you know, trying to train more curators to kind of help, help um, contribute to that. Also in the context of our Eupheno effort, we've had quite a few um, organisms come to that effort that don't have a model organism database so that they too can support that improved um, curation and documentation of those associations. And so I think we need to get more in the habit of pushing on our, on our publishers to um, help make these, this information, you know, not static screenshots or, or sort of just tables of summary level information, but actually uh, more computable in terms of the identifiers of the genotypes, the identifiers of the genes and the variants, as well as computable phenotypic uh, characteristics, which are the most often lacking uh, um, thing. So those are just some ideas, but again, a kind of multi-pronged uh, approach. So there's a question about 
I think it's already answered. Do human phenotypes also include psychiatric diagnosis or is this too complicated? And then there's Julia Murray answered that there obviously is a response to this. So what do you have to say about it? Yeah, we've been, um, so the behavior um, and psychiatric diseases um, is definitely an area of interest for us. Um, it's a very tricky area for the, for the reasons that you suggest. Um, we also have to be careful not to anthropomorphize too much. Um, so this happens a lot where we say, you know, a given model organism has anxiety. But what does it mean for that organism to have anxiety? And so there's a lot of content and data that's curated in such a way and that we have to be a little bit cautious about how we how we infer whether or not an organism has anxiety, for example. Um, but that said, I, I think that, you know, fundamentally trying to represent the actual behaviors um, in such a way that is computable across species is going to be one of the... So what does a paranoid fish look like? Exactly. <laughs> you should know you work with fish. <laughs> yeah. And so defining what does it mean? Does it mean stimulus avoidance? Because that we can document, right? And so I think, you know, where we where we can be a, a little bit more precise about how we document things that relate to psychiatric illnesses, um, that's where we're going to kind of be better at doing the, the interspecies computability. The other thing, too, is just from a just from the human phenotype perspective, we've done some work um, to just classify patient reported symptoms, EHR notes um, and the like, and try to align those with DSM. And that, that turns out to be a very effective strategy for refining how we, how we um, define and represent um, psychiatric illnesses. It doesn't really necessarily support the same kind of interoperability with model organisms, but it's definitely um, another approach that can be taken to help um, provide further granularity on the, on the classification. Hopefully right. I answered the question. I don't see any more questions in the chat, so. I think uh, we're gonna wrap up here. People can always send you questions if they have to, they can listen to your talk. It'll be posted on YouTube. And then if there are any questions, please post your email address because that's hard to find uh, <laughs> so that they can send you emails if they have any questions. Is that okay? Yep, it looks like Julie just put it in the chat. So yes, please feel free to reach out and you can also find me on, on Twitter if you're a Twitter person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fun. Thank you. Bye everybody.